Welcome everyone to the ASCAP What They Don't Teach You in Music School panel for the ASCAP experience. We all know how valuable music education and the schools and colleges and universities that provide them are. However, there are plenty of crucial career lessons that you simply can't learn in the classroom. We've lined up three of today's most exciting British composers for film and TV to discuss what they've learned on the job the hard way. I'm really excited to introduce you to three of my favorite composers who also happen to be three rather wonderful human beings who are all individually knocking out the park, as they say. So joining us today is Ruth Barrett, composer of many top TV and film scores such as Bodyguard for Channel 4 and Victoria for the BBC, which incidentally, she recently won an ASCAP Screen Award for. We've got Segan Akinola, himself an increasingly in-demand composer who created the wonderful music for the current Doctor Who series and the 2019 Sundance favorite, The Last Tree. And last, but most definitely not least, Isabel Wallabridge, who has worked in theater, TV and film, and was touted by the Guardian newspaper as one of the UK's most exciting young composers, having written scores for successful favorites such as Fleabag, Vanity Fair, and the 2018 film, Vita and Virginia. What a stellar bunch. <laughs> Welcome everyone. How are you all doing? Yeah, all right. Good. 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 Thank you for coming. We've got unusually hot weather here in the in the UK at the moment, so I'm sort of surprised well, to see you in yeah. but I know you're working, so it's okay. I'm not working, just sweltering in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me. Oops. Listen, uh, as I said, we, we're definitely not here to knock the wonderful institutions that so many of you have attended. I just thought it would be really interesting to talk about a composer's real world experiences and, and find out from you all what it's really like to compose music in today's audiovisual world. There's lots of things we can touch on. So we could look at meeting deadlines, communication skills, um, managing difficult personalities, no names, please. <laughs> the importance of, of being generally pleasant to work with and, and things like that. But why don't we jump right in and chat about something that's a really important part of the composer's skill set, and that is meeting deadlines. Um, maybe Ruth, you can start uh, by telling us what kind of tactics and tools you employ to manage your time and, and what kind of deadlines you're used to dealing with. Okay, so I had a serious test recently, which was working on an American show called Law and Order Organized Crime, which when I got the job, I was totally panicking for at least two days and couldn't do anything because they said it was going on air in five weeks. And it was an eight part, series so it'd be going out one episode per week from that point because of covid and everything everything had got pushed as late as it could possibly go and then they obviously had to take time to make the decision about hiring me until that point and then it's like okay go 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 just um so that was kind of panicky but then once i got the themes like i just literally thought okay once it stops because they were very supportive about me and the kind of music I was doing so it was like they were putting a lot of energy into just do your thing you know we, we just want you to create something that you feel you're feeling for the show and they also liked something I'd done before so they put it in as temp and I thought you know this isn't really cutting it as the temp score <laughs> but that was quite exciting in a way because I thought I could definitely improve on it as opposed to being faced with some gargantuan Hans Zimmer score all over it and you're going okay how can I possibly get get to grips with that it was kind of like an open field so in a way I just kind of just got stuck in with it and nailing some of the themes early on made it easier to meet the deadlines later because they just came coming thick and fast so the last episode was like four days to do one episode the final finale Wow. which you think by the time you get to an episode eight, you'd be, oh, I've got all the themes now. I just move them around, which I kind of thought stupidly and then went to the review and it was like, this ain't working, you know, and this ain't working. And I, I literally came out of it and I cried because I was felt like I can't do this in two days. But then I just slapped myself on <laughs> the face and said, come on, you know, this is cool. Actually, because he was so direct, it, I just thought, okay, let, I know what to do. Just, and then just, just head down and, and get it done. And literally just don't sleep or anything and just get it done. And he did it. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so it's like panic, then don't panic, then be calm and, and feel the belief that if they believe in you, then you can do the job. You know what I mean? I don't know if anyone else feels like that. I totally agree. I think it's like panic, panic, hope, panic, <laughs> hope. And then like you get it, like those seem to, that seems to be like the pattern. Panic, yeah, hope, but more than hope, like kind of belief. <laughs> yeah exactly panic panic hope belief and then maybe then maybe you could get it done that sounds like yeah. a really intense it was like, more intense than anything I've ever done yeah. before but actually it was really cool as well it was really exciting because the people who were I was working with were so kind of excited and behind it and supportive that I just kind of felt this energy behind it, you know, behind me that it was, this thing was just gonna happen because everyone was there. Like you're getting criticism, but it was very constructive and direct. So it was quite hurtful at the time because I was just thinking, okay, there's so much wrong. Oh God, I've got it all wrong. But actually that's just a natural part of the process. And by being very direct, they were speeding it up by telling me exactly what needed to be changed you know so then you know exactly what has to be done and just get on with it as opposed to well, yeah, you know do you think Ruth that if you'd had more time the music would have been like different you know so or do you think because you had like you just went like instinct this has got to be the idea and the first idea kind of or sometimes because I sometimes think that that because when the adrenaline is going so you know it's like so such fast, a yeah that actually those ideas are good ideas and you're like brave yeah. things. I think sometimes I think that's absolutely right. You kind of go into this kind of super drive state, like kind of hyper focus or something where you are flying by the seat of your pants, but because you've done all the homework at the beginning and you've kind of invested in the material and you've got these big ideas about the, not big ideas, but you know what I mean? You've found your ideas for the show and it's just about pushing it to this extra level, you know? Um, and then I think sometimes it's just like, it's like a, having a Bunsen burner up your, up your ass. It's sometimes it's just that energy that you need to kind of prepare. I mean, I'm saying if I had more time, I don't know if I'd written anything better, basically. Mm. You know, I think it was one of those things. What, have you faced that, Sagan? What do you think? Well, for me, actually, I'm, I, I'd love to talk a bit more about what you spoke about, because I'm so glad to hear you talk about Law and Order, because I think sometimes when people talk about film and TV, uh, I think what isn't always clear is that things work differently depending on where you are. And things work differently in the UK compared to how they work in America with network TV. Um, so it's really interesting to actually hear your experience, because you've got all of this experience um, and if I'm right, this is your first Network American um, show that you've worked on. And I think yeah. the thing that probably everyone talks about with the Network show is the schedule and, and yeah. how it is just so punishing. Yeah, so it's yeah. really, really great to actually hear what your experience has been like, how you've handled it, how you've handled. Uh, I'm guessing I haven't seen it yet. I do want to see it. I haven't seen it, but I'm oh, guessing yeah, it's probably. Yeah, it's yeah that's that's movie. the thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just yeah. literally. And the other thing was, it was going out. So the pressure was that it was going out. So the last episode, I finished the Thursday morning at 6 a.m. That was when they finished dubbing it. <laughs> and I had to wake, wake Ruskin up, my, my husband, who's helping me. And he is my engineer and producer and plays lots of stuff. Woke him up to play drums on one of the cues that they basically, one cue was needed to be fixed. Like, wake up! Let's get this. It's the most intense scene, and it just needed an extra. And it was just that kind of sweating, because these people are going to see it that night. Like they were going to see it first that the same day it was going to go on air, like with the time delay or whatever in America. So it's just the responsibility, um, because I feel like the performances in the show are just kind of off the scale. The the energy that goes in is so much that so you feel like this responsibility not to let let anything down. But for some reason, rather than feeling crushed by that, I felt energized by it because everyone's putting so much into it. I felt compelled to put everything into it as well. You know, it's just that momentary, oh, you know, crying for a, a moment of the pressure and then going, no, it's OK, because they've already, you know, I'm on this train and we can get 
we can get there, you know, and, and we can, we're just going to make it happen. <laughs> and it was slightly the untested thing of using so many live players because I think the way they've been used to having it is maybe just a couple of live players and mostly just done inside the box because of the, because of the schedules. And I was kind of on this hellbent route of, well, I, I work with musicians and I, this is the sound that I want. So I literally had worked out a system in which people would record um, their stuff and send it in so I could do rewrites and then the violinist would play in the parts and send them over. So I wouldn't have to waste any time recording. So it would all just be beamed in and then we'd put it all together. So that was the kind of key to it all and something we were sort of working out, I suppose, through lockdown um, has evolved like that because we haven't been able to do sessions in studios and I would never have been able to record it in air or something. There just wouldn't have been time, you know, so it was like it was kind of like a mini revolution, I suppose, that it had that it came off. That's yeah. so interesting, the like time management thing and like how to how to like make how to like plan as well. Like it's not just about writing the music do you know what I mean it's about like how to like realize it all and then when to mix it and like if you're going to mix it do you do it in the studio or do you get someone else to do it like and how yeah exactly what's the system so you can and if you've got someone doing your stems or whatever like how do you get them doing that because that's like something that I'm finding really difficult it's like if I need someone to to do stuff that I don't have like if I don't really have time to do kind of like stemming stuff out I'll get an assistant to come in but like they can only really do it from my studio and I also have to write so it's like yeah so you need another like, system that stuff to yeah. do that stuff that's what I mean we've evolved to have the uh, two systems going on along and I know exactly what you mean you can't stop so you need someone else to come in and also that person you have to absolutely trust that person yeah and mess it up because if someone messes up a stem and this is happening I mean, we've done this sending you know and it's only in the dub I'm watching at 2 30 and I'm like hang on, there's something missing from this cue. We haven't delivered the stem of something. And I'm like, I can hear it, but maybe the music editor hadn't picked it up or they hadn't picked it up because it was like, you're so used to the music. And it's like, you have to be absolutely on it. And the people working for you. Yeah, I'm not brave yeah. enough yet, I think, to like hand it over. Like if you've been working on something, no matter if, it, if it's like a number of weeks or if it's like something that you know maybe months you've been working on it and then at the last stage hand it over to someone who's only just kind of hearing it for the first time you know three days before you need to like deliver the baby you know and then yeah. they I can't it scares me too much I have to and then you so it's like yeah so like the 6am stuff is really real yeah because obviously that's asking a lot isn't it so an assistant to be there with you I mean yeah I can't do it as well like the, like the six o'clock um, <laughs> I'm going home now. Are <laughs> <laughs> you? <laughs> well, it's so true everything that you said, Ruth, about um, detail. And I think that's something that is true of our line of work, that detail is important. Uh, obviously, not everyone is going to be detail oriented. And I think if you're if you're not naturally as a as a you know as a composer, you need someone around who who is because there's just so much stuff that you have to juggle um, between uh, um, like schedules. I mean, you mentioned earlier themes, and one of the many reasons that I love working with themes it doesn't matter whether whether it's a sound or a melody or a motif. Literally, could be a, a, a pad that I like doesn't matter what it is. But one of the reasons that, that I like working with themes is because it gives what I'm working on coherence. And it also makes things quicker when you yeah. really get those time crunches, as you say, because you know that, well, they've signed off on this, the, you know, these three or four themes. And if you, you know, if you know um, enough about how to use your material, then you just get to maneuver it and change it and use it in different ways. And people may not even recognize that it's the theme. It, it doesn't matter. It depends on your use. But if you know how to use your material efficiently, then um, you get to write more quickly, which we all have to do. Um, and uh, for me, one of the things that I do in terms of deadlines is that I have a schedule that I work out with production so that they know when drafts are coming in and they know when notes, uh, when I need notes back, they can plan out when they're gonna write notes. And then we also plan out when we're gonna sign, sign off an episode. Sure, stuff might move, but 
the thing for me is the last thing I want is to get a call from someone really late saying, really sorry, haven't had a chance to do your notes. Uh, can you just do something or I'm sure it will be fine and it's not fine. So having, I find having the structure in place um, and having a schedule just so that they know when music's gonna arrive, when you know they've got time to review it. And then when I can get it back um, is really helpful for staying on track. I think particularly, particularly on TV where you've got a lot of stuff going on and you're mm. across different episodes all the time and, and you know everything's a bit sprawling and you've got one that you're spotting and then you're writing another one and you're mixing another one and you're so recording you the next one. So you could do that in a non-linear order then if you're working on something episodic? Do you work, uh, are you working on multi-episodes all at the same time? Yeah, I'm usually at different stages. So I tend to be across three, probably, I'm probably spotting one, writing another and uh, mixing the next one. Um, just wherever it falls, but I'm usually, yeah, somewhere across three. Once I've gotten like the first episode out of the way, then yeah, probably across across three, roughly. That's, yeah, that's quite hard to uh, keep in your mind. I guess with um, what I've just done, it was like this episode, this, you know, it was just like this one, this one, this one, this one. And then there'd be a few yeah. days in between. So you just cram it all in and then maybe like a couple of days off. So, <sighs> which is yeah. quite cool. I find that it's like you have to really start like understand your own stamina yeah because it's like I, stamina is like it's the only way like, and I actually haven't really like fully understood my own stamina until like really recently like because I always used to think I was really really last minute and then I realized that that was just about, that was sort of, I don't know, I don't know what that was about. That was just sort of like defensive or something, you know, if I left it the last minute, then I could, but, but it was also, I felt like I couldn't really write anything. It was like, it's like such, I don't know. I really had to kind of like settle some things in my brain to sort of be able to actually start earlier and have that same feeling of adrenaline at the beginning, which would give me the like impetus to be able to write. Um, because I really feel like I'm really good with with a, a level of pressure. I think that's like really what gets me going. But so I what have to... changed in your brain then? What was the different about this project that? Well, it was actually I spent I've spent probably this was the first time I've just done a film that I spent seven months writing the score, and I never would have thought that that w I would have been like. I think the old me would have kind of probably left quite a lot of it you know or thought that I wouldn't have been able to write it really or come up with good ideas until much much closer to the deadline I definitely would have said that and there was something really I set myself as a rule anyway with deadlines I always like set myself a deadline before the actual deadline I think it was like loads yeah. of like working in theatre where you always have to get the train before the actual train you need to get it's like yeah. well if you miss that one then so it's like setting the deadline I always set it about a week before and then I really push to get that one and then I know I can kind of fix any little tiny things in the actual week before the hard deadline um but I think so that's I think the, end, I think that's yeah good. that I really learned and that really helped with the kind of long longer period of doing something yeah. because every month I would have like within that month have set myself kind of little like real proper deadlines that I couldn't miss you know that were really kind of organized with the director and with the producers and stuff and so they were serious ones and then there are little secret ones that I have but um but then that all that also meant that about five months in I was really like burnt out <laughs> from that oh, constant right. like constant tension of you know idea creating ideas and constantly writing and yeah. then also n remembering not to throw out the good ideas that I did in month one just because it's month five or six doesn't mean that that idea isn't you know so that it was a really interesting process for me like knowing that by the time we'd finished it some of those main themes I'd written in the first round and I maybe tweaked them you know as the score kind of evolved in terms of the sound and things but um but I really learned loads and now I really know that I can write kind of in a more calm 
like, you but know, still adrenalized up. way. So, what were you? Calm yet adrenalized in a way. Yeah. Like, calm yet excited. Yeah, like, like creating your own state to be moment. it. Yeah. When you're feeling zen, I mean, I almost feel like I felt like that at the beginning of this project because I had the fear of what it was going to be, but it wasn't the immediate pressure, but it was like a, a short space of time where you just have to completely immerse and just kind of create these things and just really go from your gut and I think that's when I do my best stuff but I think I would have to re if it was over a longer time then because I, I always feel like I do it all at the beginning the main gist of it is early and then the rest is sort of growing out from that point yeah as opposed to what you just said is keeping on creating every week yeah, which is got, which is really that it really I really and then I really had to be really honest with everyone in the middle of the process and be like I need six weeks where I'm not around I'm not looking at it I'm not writing anything I really need a break and because I was just getting a bit lost you know it's becoming kind of and I was really really tired from that kind of level of focus that was like on it wasn't broken once you know through that at least kind of first five months and so. That was really interesting for me. It brings up, actually, that's a really important point I'm just thinking about. You Working on uh, any production in the, in the early days when you're trying to get cues and themes approved, I guess how you deal with, with that part of the project, because once you're underway and once you've got the momentum, as you said, you can kind of get through those deadlines, maybe not easier, but certainly with all that, that structure and material. But a really interesting thing that I think they definitely can't tell you at music school is how you deal with that criticism and those constant changes. If say you're not nailing it in the beginning bit, and I guess you, we've all alluded to that, how you, there's a couple of things, how, you know, communication skills, which are massively important because sometimes you're going to be communicating with someone who doesn't have that musical knowledge, but you are trying to get into their head and, and um, take it the way they want it to be but also something that you feel so I, I don't know what you guys feel about how what advice you would have about criticism or how you deal with the thing when you go that's amazing and someone goes nah I don't like it well what for me I, I really really appreciated um your your candor Ruth when you were talking about how you felt with that I think it was the last episode you were talking about where you had four four days because I feel like I see and hear a lot of uh, talking around being a composer being that you know we just don't that we don't care what people say you know and it's and it's really a case of oh no it, you know I completely that? remove myself I see it <laughs> yeah. I do see it online uh, and it's like oh I completely remove myself from it and you know people are just criticizing the work not 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 me as a as a person and I or whenever I hear any and I have heard composers say it and I've seen them write it and stuff you know I just think are you are you actually telling the truth? Because I honestly don't think you're entirely telling the truth because I think that, at least for me, you know, my experience with notes is that sometimes it's totally fine, you know, and I, I read it and it's like, well, okay, fine. Sometimes it's very painful and other times it's painful, but then, you know, I do the note and I think, oh my gosh, you're a genius. I wish I had thought of that initially because that's exactly what it should be. And those are the notes that, that I love, but it doesn't mean that it isn't you know, painful because if, I, if I'm sending some music over, I'm sending it because I think it's right. And I, and I obviously think I've put my, you know, my heart and soul into it. I think it's right and it's good. And then you know, some says, I don't think that's working or something that's slightly more harsh. You know, obviously. <laughs> I've had quite it's, a lot. It's, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, I don't jump for joy that someone thinks the music's terrible. Um, but also I don't go out and scream and, and, and shout down the phone at people either because it's a collaboration and I'm, I'm here to collaborate. Um, but I think it's just great because I do hear a lot of, oh, I don't, you know, I don't care about the notes I get. And uh, it's just, I remove myself from it. I just think, I don't know how you do that as a creative because inherently we put our ourselves into our work um, and yeah. so yeah I just I really I thought that was really great you can really be like I totally know exactly what you mean because I find that I can really um like identify the different like when I'm okay with it and when I'm not and it really comes down to the the way the notes are delivered because like if there's a respect in the delivery of the notes then I'm like I'll take I'll literally take it because then I'll go okay that's you know director they've they've I mean the thing I always tell myself is they've been living with this story for 
so many more months than I have. Like they are in, they've been talking about with the writer for like probably over a year about it. You know, they've been shooting, they're like so inside it. So I'm like, okay. But having, even after all of that, if they then deliver a note with like not a, you know, in, in not a very kind of, it's like, it's just a respect thing, I think. It's not even, I don't even, I really like what you were saying earlier, Ruth, about the like efficiency thing. I love direct notes. Like no yeah, but directness with care, isn't it? It's directness with, care, with yeah. respect rather than a critical yeah. parent who's beating you up yeah. and telling you off for something. Then obviously that's going to get yeah. you back up because you think, yeah. well, stop. You just, you start reacting. Yeah. Like your mum's telling you off. You start behaving like a petulant child. I mean, literally, I've thrown my phone across the room, ripped my T-shirt, kicked the door, broken my glasses from phone calls, phone calls with directors and actually it's when I phoned them up and said you know like how it made me feel and then they've gone oh oh god oh, good. sorry I didn't I didn't mean that I was just yeah in they were in their own vortex and they were just trying to get this they need this music to be right for and it's the dub and they're hectic and they don't realize projecting that onto you with this, the sensitive beings that we are because we are right we write music and we're sensitive <laughs> at least I am right yeah and they kind of like put it on you and then you're kind of in bits and they and then you tell them and actually then their behavior changes because they realize they've been a bit silly I don't want to use swear words here right <laughs> I don't know what I could use <laughs> <laughs> but I've learned a lot. I've, re I've learned so much from working with difficult people who are actually really maybe t talented and actually do you do good work for them, but sometimes make you feel like crap because of the way they speak to you. But actually, sometimes you just need to tell them that's not cool, you know, and you need to be treated with respect. And it's absolutely fine. Like the meeting I had when I cried at the end of the meeting recently on Law and Order. That was just because of the the time was so short. I just could, it, otherwise it would be a normal part of the process. And actually, it's really nice when people don't sugarcoat things and they just go from their gut and they just react and tell you how it feels to them because it's almost better to be non musically articulate to say mm -hmm. I don't like the clarinet, or whatever. I mean, who likes that? But um, you know, I want the I, this doesn't feel right. I mean, on the last one, I've gone too arty. It's like. Oh God, this is alienating. It feel it makes me. It's it gets it's pushing me back. This music, and I want to be pulled in. So like, okay, I've got you. I lose the quiet, like the quiet. I was doing some sort of weird, <laughs> trying to get it all arty, and it's like, no, don't do that. You know. So it's directness, um, dominant behaviour. It's like it's almost like analysing their personality. A lot of the people who we work with are kind of dominant personalities. And I found the best way to be with them is almost to be dominant back. So go, yeah, I get it. I see what you're coming from. Yeah, like listen to them and just kind of respond quite quickly as opposed to being crushed by them. Because I think if they respect you and they've said they love your work and everything and they're behaving like an adult, then that's win-win, right? You know, yeah. you don't want someone beating around the bush. And, no. and I, when you were saying about directors as well, you know, I've been wondering sometimes, not all directors, but sometimes because they're so close to it, that's what makes it so hard mm. as well. And that, because I've been working with more of a showrunner, they have this view of everything, like an overview of what works and it just this kind of instinct, instant, like, yeah, that's right. No, that's not right for that character. And it's not tied to a shot or a move because I've worked with directors who go, no, this camera move here the score has to change here. That there's a mood, you know, because they're so wedded to their temp score, and you're like, oh, this is, this is like imprisoning me. Okay, fine. I have to think of it like this now. I have to kind of mold the music to fit that template. But ultimately, you need to find your own rhythm, right? That's when it all flows, rather than trying to fit into copying a temp or something. You know? Yeah, definitely. One of the things you said up there, uh, Ruth, that I found really interesting is when, you, when you're talking about a director and actually telling them actually, well, the way that you're talking to me and giving me notes isn't great. And I just thought, is that something you would have done, you know, a, a few years ago or earlier on in your career? Because I, I, 
I don't know I how did you feel fairly about it, early on, yeah. and it was risky, and I did do it fairly early on. Um, and it was kind of a, one of those moments where I thought I could get fired for it, but it was also quite close to the recording as well. So I kind of thought, and it was one of those things where I was being told that the demo just didn't wasn't cutting it. It was like this does not sound remotely what it needs to be, you know. And then I sort of said, okay, well, how am I supposed to do this with this budget that you've given me? Okay, if you want this, then we need to go to a studio like air and we need to hire a string section. We need to hire a bra section. And then she kind of went, okay, well, all right. How much is that going to cost then? She suddenly went, okay, <laughs> yeah, come on then, let's do this. And it was like a change in like the atmosphere. It was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And we were like together then from that moment, we just made this great thing happen. It was because I think looking, she was looking at me like, well, who the hell is she? She hasn't done anything. She's going to produce this crappy demo. <laughs> you know, my, my film is going to be shit. And then I'm like, no, we're going to do this in a hall. So it's not, it's going to be brilliant. <laughs> so it's almost like you kind of come back confident and then they go, okay, yeah, you've got some guts. Like, come back up. It's almost like, come back at me then. You know, sometimes these people, they want to see you like, show your true spirit like it's almost like don't be scared like don't be rude to them but kind of show your what you can do like yeah but because also passion. like you are like responsible for all the music so it's like show you have yeah. to like it is down you you know that if you, to you. Like, if you like back away and shrink it's like how to I, it's hard how does that look how does that look to them you know yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not useful at all it's way better even if you feel like start to feel insecure it's always like go Confident. towards it go towards it yeah, yeah. and yeah. i think one of the things this whole thing of like what they don't teach you at film school i think one of the things that they don't and they can't really teach you is how much you have to be a head of department um, how much you have to get people on board with things, how much you have to calm their fears and how much you have to you know, sometimes persuade them, handhold the whole thing. Like, as, as you said, Isabel, as a composer, we're in charge of all of the music. And that doesn't mean just like hiding away in a room and writing some music and sending through a few files every now and then. It, there's so much. It's mega like, production, isn't it? it you're, exactly. you're, yeah. And it's almost taken yeah you're in charge of this massive but yet sometimes you feel like alone but you are you need a team and you need it's a big operation right and it does take a lot of different parts of your brain to do it yeah you know, yeah you, it's not a lone job you know you do need back guys um I'm, unfortunately we're getting a bit beaten by the clock here because i think i could talk to you all night and i think I'm so might... into this chat i think we can carry on <laughs> we can carry on chatting for the rest of the night all right, let's keep going but um <laughs> listen it's been really brilliant thank you very much i've got so many more questions but we should do this again anyway maybe and, and do some other things involved with us but i just thought if we got a little bit of time maybe you could all tell us what you're working on at the moment and if we go around clockwise and I can only I can see it. So it'd be Isabel first, Sagan and then Ruth. Um, well, I've just, I'm on Monday and Tuesday, I'm recording this, this score for a film called Munich 38. Um, so that's kind of, then, and then, um, and then there's a, another film called um, The Fantastic Flick Rocks, which is the working title that I'm working on. And both of those will be out in next year. So. Amazing. Wonderful. Second, how about you? I'm really boring because I, I'm I'm NDA'd up. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> things oh, like man. I'm really like I really actually don't think I can. I think I'd be in a lot of trouble if I mentioned do a couple do of things. Um, but I am working. You know, things are, things are going on, and there is more uh, Doctor Who on the horizon as well, um, which is always fun. Fantastic, man. I, I'm not sure if I'm NDA'd or not, but I think I can say. Maybe a shoe noir and just whisper oh, no. it. It's, the, it's, called, <laughs> it's an Amazon show called The Terminal List about a Navy SEAL. It's quite exciting action sort of Fantastic. action show. Yeah. I've got two really dark questions for you to end this one on. So one is... Don't have to think about it too much. Which score or piece of music do you wish you'd written? 
Anyone can jump in. Okay, I'm going the mission. Nice. I was nice. going to say like Morocco. Oh. Sorry, yeah, he's just so wrong. <laughs> I totally <laughs> agree. Um, I'm going to go in a completely different direction. I'm going to go incredibly recent, like so recent. Yeah. That you wouldn't even imagine it. Uh, I'm going to go. Um, well, I don't wish I'd written it. I don't think that's quite. I don't wish I'd written it because I love it as it is. But um, I've just watched Loki and um, Natalie Holt's score for that, uh, who, who I know is just amazing. Yeah. I think she's yeah. absolutely knocked out of the park, um, I which I have told her. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go with that. But I don't wish I'd written it. I just love, love it's everything. I haven't heard it at all. Fantastic. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, check it out. Very cool. And um, last really daft question. Guilty pleasure. Can we keep it musical? It's a family show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, musical. Yeah. Guilty yeah I've, musical. Been, I've been into Duran Duran recently. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's okay. Very nice. We gave them an award not, not long ago and they were fantastic. So uh, I really regret not kissing one of them at that London ASCAP where they were all there, but John Taylor wasn't there, so... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. you tell me now. Wow. <laughs> Listen, you guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give them a call and, and get you right over there. But um, yeah, me right over there. yeah. I think maybe we should end on the Duran Duran guilty pleasure because that's okay. It's they're they're fantastic. Listen, I it, I just want to thank you so much for taking your time. I know you're all super busy at the moment, and and we all really appreciate you know you taking your times out of those schedules to to chat to us and give us some really great insights. And um, let's do it again soon. Fantastic! Well, thanks, Simon. Thanks, 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 thanks so much, Simon. Great to chat to you, everyone. Really See you great. later. Bye. 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 Thanks for watching, everybody. Stick around for another great ASCAP experience session coming up in ten minutes. Just click through to the agenda page to join.